Hey there, I'm Emily. Before I dive into my story, hit that like and subscribe button. Trust me, you're in for quite a tale. The day I married Mark, it was like a dream. We were two college sweethearts, stepping into a future we'd painted in vibrant colors of love and shared dreams. Our wedding was modest, but perfect. A day shimmering with joy and laughter, surrounded by those we cherished. In those first days as Mark's wife, our small apartment was a haven of love. We'd dance in the kitchen, laugh at silly jokes, and plan for a future that seemed so full of promise. I felt like the luckiest girl in the world. But, as they say, life happens when you're busy making other plans. About a week after our honeymoon, Mark came home with a look of concern that didn't quite fit his usually carefree face. Emily, I need to talk to you, he began, hesitating. It's about my mom, Mrs. Davis. She's not well and... She needs to stay with us for a while. My heart sank a little, not out of dislike for his mother, but for the intimacy we would be sacrificing so early in our marriage. Yet how could I say no? Family was family. Of course she can stay, I assured him, squeezing his hand. Whatever she needs, whatever. When Mrs. Davis moved in, she brought more than her suitcases. She brought a chill that seemed to settle in the corners of our once warm home. She was a stern woman her eyes always holding a glint of disapproval, especially when they landed on me. I tried, oh how I tried, to make her feel welcome. I cooked her favorite meals, engaged her in conversations, asked about her health, but it was like chipping away at a block of ice with a toothpick. Emily, this soup is too salty, she'd say, or these curtains are dreadful, and often, a woman's place is in the home not out gallivanting with friends, her words were like little needles, pricking at my confidence. Mark seemed oblivious to it all. She's just set in her ways, he'd tell me. Give it time. One evening, as I was setting the table, I heard Mrs. Davis whispering to Mark in the living room. I don't understand what you see in her. You could have married someone more... suitable. I felt a sting in my heart. I wanted to confront her, to defend our love, but I bit my tongue. Mark was my husband and I didn't want to create a rift in the family. As days turned into weeks, the atmosphere in our home grew thicker, heavier. Mrs. Davis's comments became more cutting, her disapproval more evident. She would criticize everything from my cooking to the way I dressed. Emily, a woman should always look her best. You never know who you might run into, she'd remark, eyeing my casual jeans and t-shirt. I found myself walking on eggshells, trying to avoid her criticism but it was like trying to avoid rain in a storm. One day, I found her in the living room, a photo album spread open on her lap. She was looking at pictures of Mark with his ex-girlfriends, all from wealthy families. See, Emily? These girls understood what it takes to be a part of this family. It's not just about love, she said, a sharp edge to her words. I felt a lump in my throat. The message was clear. I didn't belong. I was an outsider in my own home. Each night, as I lay in bed next to Mark, I'd wonder if marrying him had been a mistake. Not because I didn't love him, but because I wasn't sure if love was enough to weather the storm that was his mother. And so, our story of love and illusions began, a tale where shadows crept slowly, darkening the bright future we'd once envisioned. Little did I know, this was just the beginning, the first whisper of an impending tempest. The atmosphere in our home had shifted. The air was thick with unspoken words and hidden glances. Mrs. Davis and her daughter, Susan, had become frequent collaborators in whispered conversations, their eyes darting towards me with thinly veiled contempt. One evening, I walked into the living room to find Mrs. Davis speaking in hushed tones to Mark. You know, Mark, I've been hearing things around the neighborhood, rumors about Emily and some man. Mark looked confused. Mom, what are you talking about? Emily wouldn't... Susan chimed in, her voice dripping with insincerity. Oh, it's probably nothing, Mark. Just gossip. You know how people talk. But then again, she does spend a lot of time out of the house. I felt a pang of betrayal. What's this all about? I haven't done anything wrong. Mark turned to me, a troubled look on his face. It's just... odd, you know? These rumors. Where do you think they're coming from? I was speechless, the accusations stinging like a slap. I go to work, Mark. That's it. I don't know where these rumors are coming from. The tension lingered like a bad smell, seeping into every corner of our relationship. Mark began to change, 
his once warm glances now replaced with suspicion and doubt. It wasn't long before things escalated. One evening, I received a text from an unknown number. Miss you already. Can't wait to see you tomorrow. Jay. Confused, I showed it to Mark. Look at this. I have no idea who it is. Mark snatched the phone from my hand, his eyes darkening. Who's Jay? Tell me the truth, Emily. I swear, Mark, I don't know. It must be a wrong number or some prank. But the texts didn't stop. They grew more frequent, more intimate, painting a picture of a secret affair that didn't exist. I pleaded with Mark to believe me. But with each new message, I could see his trust eroding. One day the phone rang. I answered it, only to hear a man's voice. Hey babe, can't wait for tonight. I was horrified. Who is this? I think you have the wrong number. I handed the phone to Mark, who was already glaring at me with suspicion. He listened for a moment, then slammed the phone down. This has to stop, Emily. Who is he? Tears streamed down my face. I don't know, Mark. I really don't. The house became a prison of doubts and accusations. Mrs. Davis and Susan watched with smug satisfaction as our marriage crumbled under the weight of these mysterious messages and calls. One night, Mark burst into our bedroom, his face twisted in anger. I can't do this anymore, Emily. I can't live with these lies. Desperation clawed at my throat. Please, Mark, believe me. I love you. I've never betrayed you. But my pleas fell on deaf ears. Mark stormed out of the room, and I was left alone, clutching at the shattered pieces of our marriage. The days that followed were a blur of tears and whispered accusations. I felt like a stranger in my own home, judged and condemned without a trial. Amidst this turmoil, Mrs. Davis continued her charade of the concerned mother-in-law. Emily, you should really think about what you're doing to this family. It's not just about you. I wanted to scream, to tell her that I knew it was all a setup, but I had no proof, just a gut feeling that was slowly eating away at my sanity. The plot against me had thickened a web of lies and deceit that was suffocating me. And in the midst of it all, I stood alone, fighting against shadows that threatened to engulf me. The walls of our once happy home had become a battleground, each day bringing a new assault on my sanity. The air was thick with tension, and the glares from Mrs. Davis and Susan had turned more menacing. My marriage with Mark was hanging by a thread, frayed by the constant barrage of lies and deceit. One evening, as I was cleaning up after dinner, Mark stormed in, his face a mask of fury. Enough, Emily, I can't live like this. Who is he? Just tell me the truth. I've told you a million times, Mark. There is no other man. I don't know who is sending these messages. But my words were lost in the gale of his rage. I don't believe you. How can I? Every day there's something new. Texts, calls. I can't take it anymore. I felt a surge of despair. What are you saying, Mark? He was unrelenting. I want to divorce Emily. I can't be married to someone I don't trust. The word divorce hit me like a physical blow. Tears streamed down my face, but I was beyond pleading. I just nodded, numb with shock. The following days were a living nightmare. I moved through them like a ghost, broken and lost. Mrs. Davis and Susan watched me with cold satisfaction, their plan coming to fruition. One day, as I sat in the living room, trying to gather my shattered thoughts, Mrs. Davis came in, a twisted smile on her lips. You brought this on yourself, Emily. You should have never married into our family. I looked up, my heart heavy. I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you doing this to me? Susan walked in, her eyes gleaming with malice. Because you don't belong here. You never did. The conversation was interrupted by a sharp pain in my abdomen. I gasped, clutching my stomach. I was pregnant, a fact that I had kept secret hoping for a better time to tell Mark. Susan noticed my reaction. What's wrong? Feeling a bit sick? I tried to stand up, but Mrs. Davis pushed me back down. You're not going anywhere. Panic surged through me. I'm pregnant. Please, I need to go to the hospital. Their eyes met, and in that moment, I saw the depth of their cruelty. Susan sneered. Oh, we can't have that, can we, Mom? Before I could react... Mrs. Dave struck me hard in the stomach. Pain exploded through me, and I doubled over, crying out in agony. You'll lose this baby, and then you'll lose Mark. You'll have nothing, Susan hissed. I struggled to get up, but they were relentless. Blows rained down on me, each one a hammer to my soul. 
Through the haze of pain, I realized I had to protect my unborn child. With a surge of adrenaline, I pushed past them and ran to my room, locking the door behind me. I grabbed my phone, trembling fingers dialing 911. This is 911. What's your emergency? Help me, please. I'm being attacked. I'm pregnant. Please hurry. The operator's voice was calm, a lifeline in the storm. Help is on the way. Stay on the line with me. I slid down against the door, sobs racking my body as I clutched my belly, praying for my baby's safety. The sound of sirens filled the air, and soon, police officers were at the door. Mark arrived too, his face a mask of confusion and concern. What's going on? Emily, are you okay? I was led out on a stretcher, my body aching, my heart shattered. As I was taken away, I looked back at the house, at Mark, at the life I thought we would have. It was all gone, replaced by a nightmare of betrayal and pain. As the ambulance doors closed, I closed my eyes, letting the tears flow. The world I knew had crumbled, but I was determined to survive. For myself and for my unborn child, lying in the hospital bed, the sterile white walls felt like a sanctuary compared to the war zone my home had become. The physical pain was bearable. It was the betrayal that cut deeper. My heart ached, not just for myself, but for the innocent life growing inside me. As I tried to piece together my shattered thoughts, Mark walked in, his face a confusing mix of worry and suspicion. Emily, what happened? Mom and Susan said you... you fell. I looked at him, disbelief and hurt swirling in my eyes. Fell? They attacked me, Mark. They wanted to hurt our baby. His face crumpled in confusion. Our baby? Yes, I'm pregnant, Mark. And your mother and sister knew. He sat down heavily, his eyes avoiding mine. They said you were hysterical, that you tried to... to harm yourself. The accusation stung like a slap. You believe them? After everything you think I would harm our child? He didn't answer, and in his silence, I heard everything I needed to know. The police came soon after their questions like needles pricking at the raw edges of my ordeal. I told them everything, the lies, the texts, the violence. Mark stayed silent, a spectator in the destruction of our life together. Mrs. Davis and her daughter are claiming it was a misunderstanding, that you were upset and tripped, one of the officers said, his notebook open in his hands. I shook my head, frustration boiling inside me. It was no misunderstanding. They planned this. The officer nodded jotting down notes. We'll investigate, ma'am. Don't worry. But worry was all I could do. My world had turned upside down, and I was free-falling with no end in sight. The next few days were a blur of interviews, doctor's visits, and restless nights. The baby was okay, a tiny beacon of hope in the storm. But the battle was far from over. Mark came to see me again. His demeanor changed, his eyes hollow. I heard the recordings, Emily the texts, the calls. I can't believe Mom and Susan would do something like this. I wanted to scream, to rage at him for his blindness. But I was too tired, too worn down by the constant fight. It's too late, Mark. Too much has happened. He reached for my hand, but I pulled away. I can't, Mark. I just can't. When it was time for my discharge, I realized I had nowhere to go. Our home was no longer safe, and I had no family nearby. A nurse, kind and gentle, came to me with a solution. There's a shelter for women in situations like yours. They can help you, give you a place to stay. I nodded, grateful for the lifeline. The shelter was a modest building, but inside, it was warm and welcoming. The women there had stories like mine. Tales of love turned sour, of trust broken. In that place of shared pain, I found a strength I didn't know I had. I wasn't alone. We were all warriors, battling our own demons, fighting for a better tomorrow. As my belly grew, so did my resolve. This child, my little miracle, was my reason to keep going, to rebuild from the ashes of my broken dreams. The accusations of attempted suicide and infidelity followed me like shadows, but in the safety of the shelter, they couldn't reach me. I was no longer just a victim. I was a survivor, a mother-to-be, ready to face whatever came next. In the quiet of the shelter, with the hum of the city as my lullaby, I cradled my newborn son, Jack. He was a tiny bundle of hope in my arms, his eyes wide and curious, gazing up at me as if to say, We've got this, Mom. Life in the shelter was a far cry from the dreams I once held, but it was a safe haven, 
a place to rebuild. I spent my days caring for Jack, and my nights dreaming up plans for a future that was still within my grasp. I wasn't just going to survive. I was going to thrive. For Jack, and for me. Hey, you're good with computers, right? One of the shelter volunteers, Linda, asked one day. I nodded. Yeah, I used to help Mark with his tech issues all the time. Linda smiled. Ever thought of turning that into a business? You could start something online, work from home. The idea stuck with me. I spent nights researching, learning, plotting. Slowly, an idea took shape. A virtual assistant business. It was perfect. I could work from anywhere, set my hours, be there for Jack. I poured every ounce of my energy into it, building a website, marketing my services, reaching out to potential clients. It was hard, exhausting work, but it was also exhilarating. I was building something of my own, something no one could take away from me. As Jack grew, so did my business. Clients started coming in, first a trickle, then a steady stream. I was doing it. I was making it on my own. The shelter had become a temporary home, but it was time to move on. With the money I'd saved, I rented a small apartment, a humble but happy space for Jack and me. Life settled into a comfortable rhythm. Work, motherhood, little joys, and challenges. Jack was a bright, bubbly kid, full of laughter and curiosity. He was my anchor, my reminder of why I kept fighting. Then, something unexpected happened. At a local cafe, while working on a project, I met David. He was kind, with a warm smile and a gentle manner. Mind if I sit here? Everywhere else is full, he asked, pointing to the empty chair at my table. Sure, go ahead, I replied, a bit flustered. We struck up a conversation, easy and flowing. He was a graphic designer, creative and passionate about his work. We talked about everything, work, life, our dreams. It felt natural, comfortable. And for the first time in a long time, I felt a spark of something other than just survival. Our meetings at the cafe became a regular thing, and soon, those meetings turned into dates. David was different. He listened. He cared. And he loved Jack as if he were his own. Two years after we met, David and I married in a small, intimate ceremony. It was nothing like my first wedding. No grand illusions. Just a deep, solid love. We moved into a bigger apartment, and our family grew. Emma and Luke were born, filling our home with more laughter and love. David's graphic design business and my virtual assistant service flourished. And we bought our first house, a beautiful place with a garden and room for the kids to play. Life had come full circle, from the depths of despair to a height I never imagined I could reach. I had found love again, not just in David, but in myself and in the life we were building together. As I watched Jack, Emma, and Luke play in the garden, David came up behind me, wrapping his arms around my waist. We did good, didn't we? He whispered, his breath warm on my neck. I leaned back into him, a contented smile on my lips. We did more than good. We made a miracle. Years had passed since the dark days of deception and betrayal, years in which my life had blossomed in ways I never thought possible. Our family was a tapestry of love and laughter, a stark contrast to the shadows of my past. One autumn afternoon, as the leaves painted the world in hues of orange and red, an unexpected visitor arrived at our doorstep. It was Mark, looking older, wearied by a life I no longer knew. I stood at the door, my heart thudding in my chest, memories flooding back. But I was no longer the woman he had left behind. I was stronger, surer of myself. Emily, I need to talk to you. It's important. His voice was solemn, carrying a weight of sincerity I hadn't heard before. I led him into the living room, where David was sitting, his presence a comforting reminder of the life I had rebuilt. Emily, I found out the truth, Mark began, his eyes meeting mine, about my mother and Susan. I overheard them bragging about how they set you up, how they lied about everything. The confession didn't surprise me. I had known the truth all along, but hearing it out loud brought a sense of vindication. I'm so sorry, Emily, for not believing you, for everything. David stood beside me, his hand on my shoulder. What do you want now, Mark? Mark looked down, shame etching his features. I've cut ties with my mother, and I've demanded that she compensate Emily for all the pain she caused. I raised an eyebrow. Compensate? Money can't undo what was done, Mark. He nodded, understanding. I know, but it's a start. She's agreed to pay a significant amount. 
I thought you could use it for your business or for charity, anything that helps you find some closure. I pondered his words. The money didn't matter, but the gesture, the acknowledgement of the wrongs done to me, offered a sense of justice. I'll accept it, I finally said, but not for me. I'll donate it to a charity that supports women who have faced similar situations. They deserve a chance to rebuild, just like I did. Mark nodded, relief evident in his eyes. Thank you, Emily. And there's one more thing. I want to be a part of Jack's life, if you'll allow it. I looked at Jack, playing in the garden, innocent of the world's cruelties. He deserved to know his father, not the man from my past, but the father he could be in the future. You can be a part of Jack's life, but we do this on my terms, for Jack's sake. Mark agreed, gratitude in his eyes. As he left, I felt a chapter of my life close, a chapter filled with pain, but also with growth. I had found justice, not in revenge, but in the strength to move on, to forgive for the sake of my child, and to embrace the life I had fought so hard to build. Standing beside David, watching Jack play, I realized I had found more than just closure. I had found peace. The scars of the past would always be a part of me, but they no longer defined me. I was Emily, a survivor, a mother, a wife, a woman who had traversed through the darkest valleys and emerged into the light. And in that light, I found my triumph, my victory, not just over those who had wronged me, but over the shadows they had cast. I was free. Was Emily right to let Mark be a part of their son Jack's life after everything that happened? Or should she have kept Mark away to protect Jack and herself from potential future hurt? Share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel for more captivating stories like this one.